Greetings, everybody. I'm uh, Julie Wiskirken from the Authors at Google team in Santa Monica. And we're extremely excited today to welcome Molly Ringwald. Uh, Molly began her film career at the age of 13 with a Golden Globe nominated performance in Paul Mazursky's The Tempest. In the 80s, she starred in such beloved coming-of-age movies as Sixteen Candles, The Breakfast Club, and Pretty in Pink, then moved to Paris in 92 and acted in such films as Seven Sundays and King Lear, a screen adaptation directed by French film legend Jean-Luc Godard. On TV, you can currently see her starring in ABC Family's The Secret Life of the American Teenager. She also appeared in the series Townies and Stephen King's The Stand. Her theater credits include playing Sally Bowles in Cabaret on Broadway, a London stage production of When Harry Met Sally, and the Tony-nominated Enchanted April. Off-Broadway, she was in Tick, Tick, Boom, and in a national tour of Sweet Charity. And today, she's here to talk to us about her brand new book, which is entitled Getting the Pretty Back, Friendship, Family, and Finding the Perfect Lipstick. So please join me in welcoming Molly Ringwald. Hi. It's so great to be here. I feel like I really fit the whole color scheme. <laughs> I'm, I'm very Google. Um, all right. Um, I think I'd like to start out with, um, usually when I read from my book, I like to start out with the first chapter because uh, I, I like people to understand that when I'm talking about pretty, it's not so much of a physical thing as it is um, an attitude and a, a state of mind. So. The, the first chapter is called, Isn't It Pretty to Think So? Early on during my first pregnancy, a female acquaintance of mine told me, you better hope she isn't a girl because she'll suck the pretty out of you. I sort of laughed, sort of. In a few short weeks, I found out that the baby was a girl. A few weeks after that, I was absolutely sure that the woman was right. I was not a particularly attractive pregnant person. Every woman I know has wanted to be beautifully pregnant, the type of cover girl pregnant where you can't tell from behind. It's only until you turn and reveal the perfect bump hovering above your Manolos that you are with child. Me, I blew up like a water balloon thanks to a semi-common ailment, preeclampsia, and a troubling, powerful fondness for macho nachos. The freckles on my face decided to band together and form a pigment block party and my ankles swelled as if I'd been stung by a hive of particularly vindictive bees. On the day my daughter Matilda was born, as I tried to tie up loose ends before heading into the labor room, I was asked to participate in a maternity gap ad, which I was obviously unable to do. When I hung up the phone and told my husband and friend Victoria, the nurse on call chimed in, that's funny, a gap ad? You look like the Michelin man. My husband, friend, and I were shocked into silence. The nurse took this to mean that we hadn't heard her and felt compelled to repeat her insight. <laughs> you look like the Michelin man, she snorted. It wasn't until she went in for the third time that Victoria snapped. Yeah, we got it. In the months after I delivered Matilda, I would catch glimpses of myself in the mirror, each time thinking the same thing. Is that me? I couldn't get over the heft of my body. I would breastfeed my daughter and look down in horror to find that my breasts were larger than her head. <laughs> my husband came home from work one day to discover me in the bedroom dissolved in tears. It's true, it's true. What's true, he asked alarmed. She got it all, she sucked the pretty out of me. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not the only woman who has felt this way and obviously it isn't only motherhood that can give you this feeling. It can be a relationship gone south, a stressful job, weight gain. What makes it so disturbing when it is motherhood, however, is the completely irrational feeling that your loss is someone else's gain, something that is so associated with something so wonderful, the giving of life. It's the ultimate bittersweet sensation. It seems to me that there is a moment when women are no longer defined as pretty. It's hard to know when exactly it happens, but suddenly you notice it. You are beautiful, unique, handsome, <laughs> if you're unlucky, or interesting. <laughs> pretty is a word that is reserved for the young. At some point, you are expected to relinquish the word like an Olympic torch. If you were ever called pretty to begin with, you know that there's a definite time limit imposed upon the word. You could say that it has the longevity of the career of an ice skater or ballerina. You get to dance Swan Lake a few times, then you're expected to teach it. 
What is pretty anyway? Not just beauty. It's an attitude toward life, a frame of mind, a lightness, even a frivolousness. It's attractive and charming, yet also naive. It's endearing, particularly because it's so innocent, because it seems to disregard or simply be unaware of all the things in the world, the experiences, the people, the accidents that increasingly defy and deny the sense of giddy hopefulness. When I told a friend I was writing a book called Getting the Pretty Back, she asked, why don't you call it Getting the Beauty Back? That's a better title. But beauty isn't what I'm talking about. Prettiness is inside every woman. It's a feeling, a sense of self that never entirely leaves. It's always there. I remember at my daughter's baptism, which we had in Greece, where my husband's parents live, watching my mother-in-law dancing at the after party at four in the morning. As she spun, I could see the village girl she had been 50 years earlier in every light, joyful step. It was moving, and it was inspiring, and it was also the best part, completely, carelessly normal. She wasn't thinking about it. She wasn't pretending. She was just doing what felt right. I watched her turning her wrists and hands in time with the music with such confidence and grace, thinking to myself, she's so pretty. Getting the pretty back is about getting back in touch with your essential self, the part of you that knows what you really want, that takes risks, that isn't scared away by all the things that can and have gone wrong. It's the part of you that runs around in summer holding your sandals in your hand. It's remembering the girl you were at 15 who did double flips off the high dive, the girl who laughed and squealed with your best friend while you huddled together in the bathroom, double piercing your ear with a needle and a potato. Being pretty can be about style or outer beauty, true, but on a deeper, more fundamental level, it's about learning to take care of yourself again. Style is the first and easiest step to reminding yourself and the world that you matter. Too often after kids, after years in and out of relationships, we settle. We stop paying attention to ourselves. Everyone else's needs come first. We'd love to try a yoga class or see a movie with a friend or visit a country that we'd never been to, but before that can happen, we have all these other responsibilities. The car payments, the mortgage, the dental appointments, the carpools, the birthday parties, the work functions. At times, they can make you feel as if adulthood is nothing more than a series of tasks to be completed. And I'm not advocating trying to recapture your youth, mostly because it is impossible, but secondly, because you shouldn't want to. Our life experience, after all, is what makes us interesting, smarter, more confident, and formidable. But being all those things shouldn't preclude being whimsical, light, flirty, and fun. At heart, prettiness is a state of mind. It's a way of looking at things, at looking at ourselves. It's just one thread of the tapestry that makes us up, but it's an important, all too often neglected thread. Luckily, it isn't so hard to get the pretty back, as I rediscovered again while writing this book. I spent a lot of time searching through my past, remembering the good and bad, and finding out what got me to where I am now, and I invite you to do the same. Whether it's reconnecting with friends that you miss, or remembering how much you used to love to dance to Banana Rama in the living room by yourself, <laughs> getting back in touch with the pretty girl that you once were just might make you realize that she isn't so far from the woman that you are today. Thank you. I wanted to read you one other part, and, uh, and I've been talking with my husband back there, who just graduated from Stanford on Saturday, just got his MBA. <laughs> Go Fania. Um, so we were talking in the car about what to read, and I didn't, honestly, I didn't expect so many men to be here. And I'm really thrilled. So I'm trying to think of, um, you know, the book is obviously um, written more for women, but not to say that men can't get something out of it, too. Um, so I don't, I don't know. There, there's, uh, there's nine chapters to, to the book, and they're all sort of about what it means to me to be a woman. So I just tried to think about, you know, what, what's important to me. And so there's a style chapter, there's a food chapter, a fitness chapter, there's even a hair chapter. Um, <laughs> so um, I decided to read something that I, I haven't actually read at other book readings. Um, and it's part of the, the style chapter, which is called It Woman, which is kind of the genesis of the book. I decided um, when I was turning 40 years old that every stylish book seemed to be about it girls rather than it women. So I wanted to write a book about being an it woman. And uh, so, so here's the, the beginning of chapter two, it woman. 
When I was seven years old, I was a tall, leggy kid with short, shaggy hair and permanently stubbed toes. And for a good deal of time, I sported a woman's stocking, my mother's, attached to the top of my head with two precisely crisscrossed bobby pins. This seemed to me... What's that? Oh. <laughs> this seemed to be, in my seven-year-old brain, the best solution as to how to exist in California in the 70s with a gorgeous blue-eyed older sister with long blonde hair. I was sure that she knew how it tortured me as I lay on the bed and watched her brush her long straight tresses and then flip it back over to have it land on her back as if in slow motion. I was mesmerized by the perfection of it. It was the perfect color, the perfect weight. It even smelled nice, Farrah Fawcett shampoo, which I'm pretty sure was just herbal essence with a picture of Farrah stuck on the bottle. I asked my mother if I could grow my hair out like my sister's. Maybe later, she'd tell me, this time we'll cut it short and then you'll see, it'll grow in thicker. This lie handed down from the ages, clearly senseless, and yet somehow at that age, irrefutable. And anyway, who doesn't want thicker hair? So off to the barber I'd go, where they chop off my honey-colored wisps and fashion my hair into a boy's cut. A pixie, my mom would say. What's his name, everyone else would say. In our neighborhood, in every direction out of our cul-de-sac, there was a home that housed a set of siblings, Joni and Jennifer to the left of us, Lori and Lisa to the right, and Karen and Krista in the middle across the street, not one of which, incidentally, had anything short of shoulder-length hair. Our games mostly consisted of freeze tag and cartoon tag, and I occasionally could corral them into taking part in a backyard vaudeville show. I'd copied out scenes from classic Abbott and Costello sketches from a local show that my brother and sister and I performed in on the weekends. I would direct them to the proper timing and sometimes have to explain the joke. Yeah, you see, his name is who? And see, the other guy doesn't get it. <laughs> this would keep us occupied until the ice cream truck or some other distraction came along and then home for dinner. Then one day, while playing inside the house, rummaging through my mother's things, I came across a long ponytail curled up in a hat box that I was pretty sure wasn't real, but nevertheless intrigued me, almost as though it were a living, breathing thing. Treating it with reverence, I carefully presented it to my mother for explanation. I don't even think that it matched my mother's hair color. Oh, it's a fall, she said. We used to wear those all the time a few years ago. Nobody wears them anymore. This information I accepted gladly, since it basically gave me free reign to claim the thing as my own. I would attach it to my head, and no one would be able to pry it loose. Unfortunately, there was precious little to attach it to. Every time I thought I had it fixed, the second I attempted to copy my sister's hair swing that I'm sure she copied from Susan Day, the flick from one shoulder to the other, the hairpiece would fly across the room and sail onto the floor. Apparently, this unhappy event actually happened to a famous singer, dancer, on Johnny Carson's The Tonight Show, which my mother remembers helped deter her from wearing the elaborate updo. And they were really going out of style anyway. This did little to deter me until I had to face the fact that as much as I loved this piece of hair and wanted it attached to me, the thing had no interest in me, preferring to hibernate indefinitely in the hat box. I reasoned that the real problem was the weight of the hairpiece, and if I could just find a less weighty version, unfortunately my mother had not invested much in her hair accoutrement. There were only two that I could find, and one of them I figured was a Halloween wig, and of little interest since it was a short curly do that looked like it belonged to Bewitch's Samantha's frisky cousin Serena. But I did happen upon a pair of stockings, one for each leg. While pantyhose were becoming more commonplace, my mother still owned the old-fashioned singular nylons, which along with the fall, I never saw her wear. The thought occurred to me that it was about the same length as the fall and a much better color match. Two bobbies later and I was in business. I flicked my head around and admired my handiwork. Then I ventured out into the neighborhood. My friends made no mention of my new hairdo. If they even noticed, they didn't let on. I was filled with a combination of relief and disappointment. Relief that I wasn't about to be made fun of mercilessly. I still can't quite believe it. I don't know if it's the age or the place, the fact that I had exceptionally kind friends. And disappointment because couldn't they see I had long hair? Then a couple of days later, I noticed Jennifer sporting a black stocking on her head. <laughs> Soon all the girls tried it out, even pinning their own hair up in order to show the stocking hanging down. Joni went so far as to put pantyhose on her head, but we all agreed that was ridiculous. <laughs> It was at that time when I realized that I had set a trend. I had an idea that was different. I executed it and I watched it catch on. It was magical the way we all entered into a tacit understanding that stockings on our head was cool, even when the evidence should have clearly showed us otherwise. 
I think I discovered at that moment that fashion was fun and ridiculous, but most important that as long as I set the trend instead of following it, I'd be okay. Thank you. So I guess now is the Q&A part. If you have any questions, if anybody has any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Yes? <laughs> Great question. Um, I, uh, I actually, I flew to London to have the cover photo taken by a friend of mine named Fergus Greer, and it was styled by a wonderful stylist, and they are Manola Blahnik. And um, I actually, it, it has taken me months to actually have those shoes in my possession now. <laughs> I have them. That was way back in December, and I desperately wanted them. I thought, I have to have these, these shoes. They're like the modern day, um, like Dorothy from Wizard of Oz or something. So they made me a special uh, pair because they, apparently they were all gone. So, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I have one. Um, I actually saw you when I was living in New York in Tick, Tick, Boom, and, which I thought was great. And it was all about kind of the turning 30 and, and how to deal with that milestone. And now yes. your book's about turning 40. So I was wondering if you thought back to that musical or if you saw any parallels between those two. Um, I actually, I haven't made the connection, but it, it's, it, it is, a, I think, a similar feeling. I think for women... 40 is, is even more. I mean, 40 is really the moment when you can no longer call yourself an ingenue in, in any realm at all, you know? And, um, and, you know, most people by the time they're 40, um, ha you know, have kids and, you know, or, you know, I mean, I had my kids later than, than most people do. I have um, a six-year-old daughter and 11-month-old uh, twins. Um, yeah, they're so cute. <laughs> Um, but, you know, 40 is really that age that I think it's not so much that you feel different, it's that, um, that you feel that everyone sees you differently. Um, I was doing, um, when I was on my book tour, I was doing Regis and Kelly, and she, she actually had a really great comment that I think she heard from someone else, but it seems that at 39, everyone says to you, are you okay? You look so tired. And then you turn 40 and they go, wow, you look great for 40. <laughs> you know, It's like suddenly the perception completely changes. Um, but yeah, I mean, Tick, Tick, Boom was very similar. I think, I think Jonathan Larson really felt that way because his, his career really hadn't taken off yet. He was still the starving artist. And I think um, for him, he felt that that's acceptable. You know, we all put these numbers in, you know, our, they, they don't really mean anything. It's just what we put on ourselves. You know, when you're, when you're creating, when, you, when, you're, um, when you're an artist, it's like you, you should have arrived already by the time you're 30. And I think that was the pressure that he felt is that, um, that after 30, it was like, okay, now he's going to have to get a real job, you know. And I think that, that this happens all the time. I think, you know, I'm, I remember turning 25 and feeling that, you know, oh my God, I was so old, you know. <laughs> you know, it's just, it, it, it happens all the time. You know, you're a teenager and all you can think about is, is being 21. And then after 21, it's like, oh my God, I'm so old, you know. I, it's going to happen. I think, I think I'm going to look back on turning 40 and feel like I was a baby, you know. So, any other questions? Yes. Stephen King's The Stand is a marathon of a book by any means. So when you're preparing or in any time since, have you read the book? I read the book um, while I was making the movie, actually. I hadn't read it prior to, to doing I read the script. And um, the, the script, the, uh, or I should say the teleplay, because it was, it was a television movie, I think was a pretty faithful adaptation. Because I remember as I was reading the book, I felt like I had just read it, <laughs> you know, because I just read this incredibly long teleplay. Um, but, um, you know, usually, I mean, I think I, I prepare differently for each project. Sometimes I feel like I, I understand the character completely. I mean, like, for instance, all the John Hughes movies I did, there was not a lot of research that went into those parts, you know. They were very similar to, to me or to somebody that I knew. Um, but then other parts obviously require more research. 
So uh, I love the movie adaptation, and watching it is an effort in itself. So how was filming it? I mean, it's, it's so long. It was really long. I had just moved to France, actually, and that was the first time that I'd been back in America since I had chosen to move to another country. Um, and I, I remember having a lot of uh, downtime and, and constantly trying to, to get back to France, you know. So um, <laughs> it, was, uh, it, was, it was such a big, huge cast. And, um, you know, I, I just, I mean, I had most of my scenes were with Gary Sinise, and he's, he's an amazing actor and, and a great guy to work with. So, um, so I, had, I had fun making it. Thanks. Sure. Yes. Uh, that's a great question. Thanks. Um, I don't prefer any any of them. I think. I I mean, I started out doing theater, so I think theater is a little bit like my first love, uh, and I've always felt really comfortable on stage. Um, and then I moved to film, and I think I'm more known as a film actress. Um, I love the immediacy of television, and I and I love how many people you can reach on television. You know, I. After I, I lived in France for all those years, I came back to New York and I did almost exclusively theater for about 10 years. And I feel like, except for the people that happened to be there at the time, nobody knows. It was like I wasn't doing anything for, for 10 years, you know? But I mean, people that were there, you know, I, they, they saw me in all these plays and they thought, oh, I didn't know you could sing, I didn't know you could dance, you know? But then it just, there's all these people that it doesn't reach, you know? So that doesn't mean that I don't love doing it, but I, you know, obviously when you work, you love to, to be able to, to connect with people and to reach people. So, um, so I did all of that theater and then I moved here and now I'm on a television show and it, it, it always seems like I love to go back and forth. I mean, I would love to go back to New York and do, it's been, it's been a couple years now since I've done a play. I would love to do, you know, especially with the Tonys last night. I think, oh my God, I love, I love doing theater. You know, and I'd love to do more films. I think it really just depends on the project. And I think that there are certain projects that, that sort of lend themselves to a certain medium. So, it depends on the story. Yes? I feel like French women are... I mean, they're, they're incredibly stylish. They seem to come out of the womb <laughs> with an Hermé scarf just sort of wrapped perfectly around their neck. Um, they just seem to have a, 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 an innate sense of style um, that I really think comes from a sense of confidence. You know, when I was writing this book and going through the editorial process, um, I did a word search one day on the word confidence because I wanted, or confident, I wanted to know how many times I used that word and it was ridiculous. It was like 25 times I used the word confident. But I think it really said something about one of the themes of my book, which is how confidence, confidence in yourself is one of the most important things. Because if you don't have confidence in yourself, no one's going to have confidence in you. And it, and it affects everything. It affects your style. It affects the, the way that people listen to you. It, you know, it affects everything. So um, I think that that's something, and I don't know exactly, where, it's something that was very interesting to me, figuring out where, where French women come up with this sense of confidence. And I, I really do think it has something to do with their culture. Um, and it's something that I hope to impart on, on, on my children, my, my girls especially, you know, the feeling that they can do anything that a man can do. And in heels backwards. <laughs> Great question though, thank you. Does anyone on the video conference have questions? Oh, I think this gentleman has a question. Um, so you played uh, a teenage mother, and so I'm wondering, when you were pregnant with your first child, did you ever think back on uh, that movie, and did anything seem particularly realistic that suddenly made sense, or some unrealistic, or something? Any, any thoughts about that? Um, well, I think everyone is different, and, and how they deliver their children. Um, as I remember, I haven't seen that movie in a long time, but I remember I, I did a lot of yelling and screaming. 
as most people do when they when they have that that scene where they're delivering children, you know, there's like, <laughs> you know, all of that stuff. And I, and I did that and, and it seemed very realistic at the time. Um, but, uh, but having had three children now, I, I didn't deliver at all that way. Not to say that it didn't hurt because it did a lot, but all of my energy was very internal and very, you know, I felt like I couldn't make that much noise because I, I would lose my concentration and all I was focused on was getting this baby out. So, you know, if I had to do it over again, I might have played that scene a little differently. So, yes, <laughs> to answer your question, I, I, would, have, I would have done it differently. <laughs> yes? Um, so, when, oh, okay, thanks. so when writing this book, was there any one particular chapter that was your favorite writing? Or I guess I'm just reading through it. And I'm like, she gives good email. That's an interesting one. But I, I, my question is, like, which one was your favorite in writing if you one um, or if there's one like that sticks out the most well when I had the the concept for the book like I said I wanted to write this sort of girlfriend's guide to being a, a stylish woman and I, I feel like so many people feel like they grew up with me because they kind of did you know my movies are sort of a rite of passage you know for for so many people um, so I, I, I had the idea I knew I wanted it to be illustrated and I was really fortunate enough to get my dream illustrator, Ruben Toledo, to, to um, illustrate the book. Um, but I, I always knew that I wanted it to be part narrative about my life, about my friends' lives. And then I also wanted to have sort of a, a, an advice aspect to it, because I've always been sort of like the go-to girl for all of my, my girlfriends. Um, but I found that all of the narrative was so much easier to write you know, all the storytelling that, you know, and I think that has to do with, you know, my background as an actor and getting into characters and telling stories. When it, when it actually got to the advice part, even though I have been that advice kind of girl, it, it is sort of hard. Once you put things down on, on paper, I didn't want anyone to feel like I was a big old know-it-all, you know? <laughs> and all of these, um, all, of, all of the advice that I write is really just you know, I'm not an expert in any of this. this. This is just strictly my opinion. You know, I have a whole chapter, we were just talking about that, on, um, on t-shirts. <laughs> I have a whole sort of manifesto on you're not a billboard. Um, and, that, and that, you know, we, we shouldn't be advertising other people's, you know, mo mostly it's those horrible slogans or those, you know, those t-shirts that you pick up on vacation that say Barbados, you know, and it's like, what is this really telling the world, you know? <laughs> Um, but anyway, to answer your question, I think, I think all of the parts, the, the stories about, um, my, about my friends or, you know, about my life, I think those were the definitely, or, or the one that I read to you about being a little girl and, and sticking a stocking on my head. I think those were the most fun to write. Yes. So I have a less in-depth question about fashion. So like for me, being almost 40, the most disturbing thing is now I see teenagers like dressing like the 80s and now I'm like that old person you know who the era has come back right. and, so, um, and it's really weird because I feel like some of the kids they just could have gone to my high school like it looks yeah. exactly the same so they say that um, if you were old enough to wear the fashion the first time around you shouldn't wear it the second time around <laughs> I disagree. <laughs> okay. I, I respectfully disagree with that. Um, I, you know, I, I think that you shouldn't dress head to toe in, in anything that you wore. I mean, mostly because it probably doesn't fit, you know? I mean, I still have clothes that I wore in the 80s, but, you know, most of them don't, don't fit the same. I mean, I'm hanging on to them, you know, for, for my kids. And, uh, you know, but, but I think... I think the 80s now that, that people, I think there's kind of like cherry picking the best parts of, of a particular era. You know, there's certain 80s-esque things that I wear now, you know, sort of color choices. I mean, Google, very 80s, you know? I mean, all of, you know, all of the primary color, the yellow and the, you know. Like, I find myself doing that now. I have a, a pair of, you know, yellow Ray-Bans or, you know, different you know, hats or, you know, there's certain things that I, that I associate with the 80s that I still wear, but, but I try to make it modern. It's not just head to toe. And, you know, to be perfectly honest, in the 80s, I was doing other eras, you know, I, I was doing, that was my version of the 20s, 
you know, or you could say that the shoulder pads from the 80s was, was inspired by the 40s. I remember in the 70s being obsessed with the 50s, you know, with Greece and everything and, and thinking that the 50s were just the coolest thing ever. So I think all those fashion, it just, it's constantly re recirculating. There's nothing really original except for the way that you interpret it. Wow, I like that answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm impressed, thank you. Sure. Yes. Oh. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm so excited to read this book. I was flipping through. Um, I just, since you've, you know, covered all the other media, movies and theater and whatnot, I just wondered, do you have another book in you? <laughs> I should hope so, because I signed a two-book deal. <laughs> so I'm really hoping that there's a book in there somewhere. Uh, I was just actually talking to my husband about that um, in, the, in the cafe, um, I, I really, after writing an entire book about myself, I really want to write about something else. <laughs> so I think, I think probably my next book will be fiction, um, just so I could kind of get into those characters. And, you know, I, I, I think that's sort of what I'm leaning towards. And then if I ever write about myself again, it'll be, you know, a long time. It'll be like the official autobiography years and years from now. <laughs> Um, so I read a little bit of your book at the airport a week ago, and you have a chapter on, well, not cha uh, you have a small part about uh, dating a younger guy, what happened to him, and uh, how did it work out? He's sitting right back there. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, you know, it's hard, right? Like, women are supposed to date, usually date, we're trained to date you know, uh, older men, mm -hmm. and older men prefer younger women, so yeah. what are your thoughts and... How did it all work out for you? Um, you I, <laughs> well, he, he actually was the, the first and, um, and last old, uh, younger guy that I dated. Um, it, it was hard. You know, it's true. Women are sort of, I, I don't know why exactly, um, why we are taught to date older men. I mean, considering that women are supposed to live longer, it makes more sense to date younger men. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I, I, like all, you know, many other women, I had always dated guys that were older. And it was sort of by accident that, as I write about in my book, that, that we even ended up dating at all. I, I, we, we met through a mutual friend um, on email, actually, and I, we didn't even actually meet in person for about six months. And I actually thought that he was an older man because of the way, <laughs> the way that he writes. I had this sort of vision of this, you know, old, swarthy intellectual, and, and he was this 25-year-old um, cutie pie. Uh, <laughs> so um, so it, it was a little bit of, uh, of an adjustment in, in my head because it, he wasn't exactly what I envisioned. And also I had that hang-up, like, how could I date somebody young? Like, this, who, who am I? Is he a boy toy? What's the deal, you know? <laughs> Um, but then I, I got over it, you know, and now I, I don't even think that we don't even notice the age difference. It's seven years, which, you know, is, is a significant amount of time. I do believe that our lives are sort of lived in seven year cycles. So occasionally I'll notice that I'm in one stage of my life and he's in another stage of his life. But, um, but it's okay. I think it's, you know, three kids later, almost 10 years later, I think uh, it's worked out okay. <laughs> Does anybody on video conference have a question? <laughs> Hi, people. They're thinking about it. The guy in the blue shirt. I can tell. <laughs> or no, he's just he's just chatting with someone. Uh oh. <laughs> Do you, okay. Um, I guess we'll take one more from Agraja. Thanks so much for coming in. Um, I think it's great the uh, transition you were able to make or just like looking over the past, I don't know, it's probably embarrassing, but those terrible countdowns of child actresses and where they are, and you're always the success story. Um, <laughs> That's nice, so, thank you. <laughs> I think it's very admirable. Um, and I was wondering, I mean, I heard that you probably credit to your time in France and just being away and that kind of thing. And we already kind of touched upon like women and friends being beautiful and the confidence and stuff, but how did that impact your life and your career? And do you recommend, like, what do you recommend to other people, maybe if we can't go to France, but that kind of defining moment <laughs> that, you know, helps you transition from where you were before to, you know, where you are now? 
Um, which part of that question should I, <laughs> should I address? That was a very long, um, interesting, complex question. Um, I, I think, you know, France was sort of my version of going to college. In fact, I had applied at USC and gotten accepted and was supposed to go into the fall um, to, to start getting my college education and then went to France to do a movie over the summer and just stayed. Um, so that, it, you know, that was sort of my version of, of the college years. And I had been working for so long that I'd never really been, I felt like I'd never really been out of the public eye. And I felt like for me, I needed to go somewhere where I wasn't recognized, um, that I, I could sort of make mistakes and be silly and just do all that stuff, you know, that, that, that everyone basically does in college, you know? Um, and that's, that's what I did. And I, that, that's what worked for me. But I think, you know, everyone's different. I think um, it also had a lot to do with sort of following my bliss and feeling like if I didn't do it at that time in my life that I would never do it. And I, and I always wanted to live in, in a foreign country. Um, and I've always had a thing about France. I don't know why. It might have been a past life thing <laughs> or something. But, you know, in my house, my mom was a chef, and she really idolized Julia Child. And Julia Child was always saying, bon appétit. And, you know, so to me, that was just, you know, it represented something so beautiful and so cultural. And I just, it just really spoke to me. But I think it's different for everyone. But I, I, I really, I do recommend that somebody lives outside of their own country for a period of time just because it, it just completely changes your perception. You know, you live in this country and you're taught things in your history books and it never occurred to me that people have completely different points of view, you know? We think we're sort of the center of the universe here and guess what, in France they think that they're the center of the universe and I think every country is different but I, it, just, it, it just completely opens up your, you know, the world just becomes a much bigger place and, uh, and that's really what it did for me. Thank you so much for having me here. This has really been fun. And I have to say, I have to say I'm a very big Google fan. And, um, and, and also my mother, who is not the most computer savvy person in the entire world, just called me up, I would say about a year ago, and said, Molly, there's this incredible thing called Google. Have you heard about it? You can, you can ask it any question. And it'll answer you. Great, Mom. Anyway, so many, many Google fans in the, in the Ringwald household. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you again.